League of Legends Anonymous podcast. I am your Sam, aka Just Casual. Here I have with me Blake, aka Wise Baba Smurf. Hey man, as a matter of fact, I don't let nothing hold you back. If the scat man can do it, baby, so can you. <laughs> and Alec, aka Wormlax. I'm just contemplating whether I should really be here after what Blake just said. <laughs> I think fate is telling us not, since this is the third time we're trying to record this freaking thing. But uh, you know, I think it's happening. Sorry for everyone in Twitch chat, which is, I think, no one right now. But so my apology is, I don't know, just this, death years. This reminds me of a time when I was on my high school. We had a meet with this other rival team that uh, got rescheduled five times because of snow. We canceled it altogether. Jeez. That's unfortunate. Yeah. That's never fun. It was interesting. It wasn't meant to be. It was not meant to be. You know what it is meant to be? Talking about one-trick ponies today. Um, actually, we have a ton of emails that we want to get through and, you know, just comments on Facebook, those kind of things. If you want us to answer a question, we get a lot of our content from the community, whether it's Facebook, Twitter. Facebook's probably the easiest place, and then email as well and stuff like that. So feel free to drop us questions whenever you want. We'll get to them. Uh, either we'll respond to them directly or bring them on the show. Most likely we bring them on the show. But um, unless it's really, really simple and probably on. Not needed to discuss on the podcast, but that aside, should we start the first email? Yeah, man, let's do it. For it. I'm busy adding Scatman to my streaming playlist. So <laughs> All right, so the first email is from Sochella. I think that's how you pronounce the name. Says, my question is, how do you decide on a main or one trick, and what tips would you recommend to someone trying to decide on a main? I have been playing since season one, and I've had a really hard time deciding on a champion. It wasn't really a problem until I started to play ranked at the tail end of season five and found a love for tryhard. But it's been two seasons and I still can't decide. Please help. Well, for me personally, it has always come kind of like a natural thing that I think about what kind of play style, like what what suits me. I back in the day, I used to be an AP cod main. And be, I did that because Kagma AP his scaling was insane into the late game. Mm-hmm. So I was playing in silver at the time, and it was like every single game is going 30 plus minutes. I need someone who is just going to carry me no matter how good my team is playing. So that's kind of how I slipped into that role. And as of recently, when I've been mating Renekton, the reason I started mating Renekton was because, wow, I really am good. Like, I crush lane a lot of the time. And, but if I don't get far enough ahead, it can sometimes squander into the late game when I'm playing in Platinum. So if I play someone like Renekton, who just absolutely smashes early game, I can get a really hard lead and just end the game before I have to deal with some of the late game threats. Gotcha. Cool. How about you, Blake? Any tips? Sure. I mean, okay. First off, I would say enjoyment factor is Mm -hmm. enormous like that you cannot underrate i could not one trick a champion that i hate playing it doesn't matter if it perfectly fits my play style if i don't enjoy that champion then i'm not gonna have a good time with it so i can't Mm -hmm. spam the requisite number of games to be considered like a one trick right yeah so i would say this any champion that you pick to one trick any one of you can actually learn and carry games with because the key is being like better than your elo at whatever champion you're playing right Mm -hmm. so whether that's like a low skill ceiling champion like annie i mean annie bot got to challenger right so it doesn't doesn't matter how rewarding the champion truly is right It's about finding a champion that clicks well with you and that you think is fun and that you're willing to just grind out as many games as humanly possible. And the more you enjoy the champion, the less that grind feels like a grind. Yeah. Right? I The only thing that is like, I used to play just dick tons of Thresh. Like, that was all I played. Well, you know, most of my games. And then... You know, I played a bunch of Bard, and I played... Then I would go back to Thresh, and then I'd play a different champion. I'd go back to Thresh, and I'd play Blitz, and I'd go back to Thresh. And then, you know, <laughs> it, like that was, like, my guy. Since Masteries came out, I've had a hard time doing that because I keep, like, 
coming up with new stupid champions to try to get Mastery 7 on, right? Um, that being said, I honestly think that if you're going to pick a champion, the best and most important thing is enjoy it. And then the second is that you have some sort of synergy with that kit. So to use like Thresh as an example, for me, I always like, I like hitting skill shots and that's a strength of mine. Uh, doing hard engagement is a strength of mine. Um, being able to fix an opponent's position and know how to do that well, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that, that can work. And like, I can drag people into a fight as if from nowhere to make it a win. Right. And that's something that I thoroughly enjoy doing. However, even one tricking thresh champion that I love and completely synergizes with my like person, it can be frustrating at, at different elos. Right. And I think like, I don't, you know, okay. I want to be clear when I say this, cause it's very difficult to summarize my thought. <laughs> you should pick somebody that you really love. If you don't have somebody you really love, that's like right off the top of your head, that's a champion that you really want to play. Then like, think to yourself, what are the things that I want to be able to do really well? And climbing should not be on that list. Like, of course you want to climb, right? Everybody mm -hmm. wants to climb. You'll climb by playing any champion a whole lot. Like, that will make you climb. That will mm -hmm. make you peak, right? What I'm talking about is, like, do you want to do damage? Do you want to have snowball potential? Do you want to have a ton of utility? Do you want to uh, have a strong early game, have a strong late game? Like, what is the game you like to play that you can exaggerate? And then you start looking at champions that match that style. Are you looking for somebody who has a really high skill ceiling that, like, like a Riven or something that you have to play a boatload of games, but if you have good mechanics, it rewards that? Mm -hmm. Or are you looking for maybe somebody who's not so mechanically intensive but can still do flashy things? You know, it... it like you have to kind of make a list about yourself that reflects the things that you most desire in a champion and then try to find a champion that matches those things. And if you find that champion and you still don't have fun playing that champion, pick somebody else. Yeah. It might take a while. There's a lot of champions to go through and even playing a champion once you're not like, Oh, this is my champion. I understand him. And this is how I fit. Like this fits me. It take it still takes a while. You could say that about like, Wow. Zed felt really good because you had a really bad Yasuo on the team, so you went 35-3. and three. I'm not talking about this from personal experience from my last solo queue game with the Zed on the opposite team or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've never seen a Zed get 36 kills since well, like I was level... You know, yeah, it's, it's been a while. The other thing I want to say is if you do pick somebody like Zed or Yasuo or Riven or whatever, don't expect to be a god overnight. Like... Mm -hmm. You will yeah. not be good at those champions that have the world's highest skill ceiling in 10 games, in 20 games, in 50 games. It, you know, it takes, like, if you're going to play Lee Sin, you're going to play, like, 250 games of Lee Sin before you're actually good at that champion. Yeah, I have uh, level 7 mastery on Riven, Yasuo, and Lee Sin. I am trash at every single <laughs> but they are fun champions to play and someone like Lisa and I've put enough time in now I've gotten decent at him but like Riven and Yasuo as of recently I haven't played them as much as I used to and when I try to go back and play Riven the way I did I it's not the same I'm not as good as her like even though right now I'm a higher rank than I was when I was maining Riven I'm not as good a Riven player anymore because that yeah. champion is so skill intensive that I like fell out of practice it's the same thing if you were, you know, you're playing football or something and you're at QB and then you play wide receiver, when you go back to QB, you're not going to be as good. And if you swap around a lot, it's going to take, like, time to get back to those different skill, like, yeah. levels. And especially yeah. if you're not playing, like, eight games a day. That, that's a big thing, too. If you're playing, if you're busy, you're playing five games a week, maybe even two games a day, like, that's probably not enough frequency to continue to get better at everything you're trying to get better at. 
So instead, you need to, if you really want to get better at something and you you really care about that, then you need to narrow your focus so you can concentrate on something small and continually work on that. Yeah. I, I would say as well that any time that you devote solely to one champion works really well for your climb mm -hmm. because everything else about your champion pick is no longer a variable in your gameplay because it's a given. It's the same every single time. So, like, once you master, I don't know, Lux's mechanics, right, mechanical misplay doesn't lose you games because you're already good at Lux's mechanics. So now it mm -hmm. just becomes like, well, how well do you do macro play? How well do you take towers? How well do you CS? How well do you do the other building blocks? Like, how well do you play any champion versus how well do you pilot the champion you've chosen? Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. I get it. Like, less variables. So Yeah, it's kind of like better. thinking about how they talk about, like, don't be the one person flaming on your team because, like, if you take yourself, you're not going to flame when you play. Then that removes one person from the game who's going to be flaming, right? Yeah. It's the same thing with if you're thinking about there's 10 champions in the game, you have to know and know every single ability. You're taking one out of the equation if you've played one so much that you just have an insane knowledge about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another thing I don't think we touched on yet right now is... Uh, Actually, there's a few things I want to talk about. Uh, one, it really depends on what your goal is, too, right? Yeah. Um, one tricking is not for everyone, and even if you, if you, even if you focus on climbing, sometimes like getting a seventy percent win rate is not worth you getting so bored and hating the game because you just can't find any champion to just one trick because you just don't like to one trick. That's perfectly fine, you know. Uh, if you one trick, you probably will climb faster with less games and do better but there's nothing wrong with expanding your range of skills especially if you have a lot of time to play and you could pick up three champions to play and you can keep swinging them around or maybe you need to instead of going into ranked you play normals for on like your zed and lee sins or random champions that you're trying to learn until you can bring them into ranked where you don't hurt your ranked climb again if that's a goal it really depends on what you're doing I love, so let me just like i think one tricking another word for it is peaking because that's exactly what you're trying to do when you one trick is peak out your elo right and that's fine if that's if that is your goals like see how high i can get on the ladder you do that by one tricking mm -hmm. right like you do that by picking a very limited champion pool and riding that shit all the yeah. way as high as you can go but some people aren't about that. They just want to generally perform and then do it in a competitive environment. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Do that, right? Like, pick whatever you want to play. That's fine. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a ranked ladder. There's no money. You know, you're not going to get paid if you hit diamond or anything. Hey, so, unless you're a collegiate. I mean, uh, yeah, trying to get sure, a collegiate scholarship. Would, I'm not sure. I guess no. that would make a difference. But, I mean, there's nothing mm -hmm. on the line for the vast majority of the players. It's just bragging. Yeah. Yep. So... If you enjoy something, do it. But, you know, this is a, for people who are trying to peak, this is how you do it. And for me, I enjoy the game the most when I'm playing at, like, my best. I mean, I, I will say this, too. Um, I think one-tricking is a nice way to play, hurry up and climb at a higher level so you can play different type of champions. For example, when I was playing Alistar, which... I mean, I remember you and Ernie said, like, my Alistar play is pretty good. But when I was playing Alistar in my solo queue games, I just couldn't carry the team because Alistar is that team dependent, and I just don't know how to carry, like, a silver game with Alistar. I just couldn't find success. But, you know, I played, like, Zyra a whole bunch, climbed, like, mid-gold or something like that, and then suddenly I could bring out Alistar and have a better success because, like, that's just how it is, you know? Yeah. So one tricky well, can like, also kind of get you past like, that uh, plateau. Like there are certain champions that just don't perform in certain elos. I would mm -hmm. never play Thresh below gold. I struggled with Thresh in platinum, and I can carry with Thresh in diamond. And that's, yeah. that's fucked up for somebody who has as many games on that particular champion <laughs> as I do. And it, it is definitively, like, my best champion. But I can't, 
like there are elos of which I cannot get it to work well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just better off with something that is a little bit more like attack now than, you know, even thrushes like blitz. Yeah. It was far easier for me to carry games with Blitzcrank through Platinum than it was with me to carry them with Thresh, and they have very similar play style. Yep. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is choosing the champion besides just, like, what you like. The way I have liked picking my one-trick champions, because I, I pretty much one-trick, like, every season for the most part, uh, I look at the meta and see, like, the top win rate champions, and I avoid those, especially... Actually, I take that back. If they're high win rate and high pick rate, I avoid those because those get banned, they get nerfed, things happen to them, right? Mm -hmm. So what I do is I try to look for like that second tier where they have a really good win rate, but they don't have much of a play rate. And then I look at, like, if I'm looking at OP.GG, I look at gold because that's where I'm at. But then I also look at plat and see like what's up there. And if, if, they, have a, if they have a decent win rate there too, then I'm like, most likely my champion is still like, okay at higher elos too like the champion pick isn't what's gonna hurt me it's my skill on that champion right if i'm playing like if i pick a champion and have the lowest win rate yes i could probably climb to diamond if i was good enough but i'm probably not good enough so uh why make it that difficult for me unless i just like doing that kind of stuff so i like looking at slightly out of meta champions that aren't popular that i think perform well so one of them was uh um sona like sona is always good every season but yeah. she's never in meta when it comes to competitive and that's what everyone's talking about when they look at meta so it was a little different sona has been kind of strong recently but for the most part sona has been on the top of the ladder with a very low pick rate yeah i would say one of the things like a good example champion of what you're talking about is like singed if you look at singed yes. right now he is fifth in win rate overall mm -hmm. in the top right mm -hmm. um his like play rate is not particularly high he's 21st of 51 in top so like real middle of the pack at three yeah. percent play rate right so he's not going to be on the radar for nerfs and he's doing really well right now so that may be a champion that you'd want to invest some time in the other thing that you're going to want to look at is like what is his win rate based on the amount of like games somebody plays of that champion and you see that only on champion.gg right is that the only resource that does that i think champion.gg is the one that does that yeah i know yeah. they do that i just don't know if anyone else does it because i know it's everyone has their like pre preferred one not see it there uh, there's probably more. Does, is it like MOBA Analytics that does that as well? Oh, they might. I know there's a couple does. out there. You can tell that like singed play rate, it kind of peaks at 50 to 100 games, and then it goes kind of down at 151 to 200. But all of those, I have some experience on this champion games. Mm-hmm it's all well over 55% win rate. Gotcha. So that would be a very good champion to pick up in terms of, you know, it will reward mastery. It is already a high win rate champion that's strong, and it's not likely to be nerfed. But that's also a champion with a very unique play style, so if you're going to play it, you better play the hell out of it. Because it doesn't yeah, there's a learning curve to Singed. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. cross-translate into any other champion at all. Yeah, those skills don't help you with any other champion. They don't teach you anything else except how to play Singed. That's it. Why That's are you it. running in front of everyone that sins out? <laughs> I'm poisoning them. Yeah, why are you farming between turrets at level one? <laughs> this is just ridiculous. Yeah, Singed Singe is... He's a fun guy. I also loved... I love that they added his laugh to every time he flipped someone. That is just... <laughs> The best thing ever. Such a tilter. Um, yeah, he is. Don't chase Singe. If you guys haven't heard that, I don't know. How, I think some people actually haven't heard that because that was pretty much like season one beaten to death. Um, but Number since one then, world league. Yeah, don't chase Singe. Don't chase don't, face, don't face check bushes, especially if Garen's on the map or in the game. <laughs> yeah, those are one of the old, like the oldest uh, oldest rules in the book. But 
All right. We good with this question? Yeah, I feel good. Yeah. I think, yeah, just to wrap it up. I mean, in the long run, it's it's a video game. So if you start meeting someone solely to climb and you're not enjoying it, like you're not going to climb. You have to enjoy who you're going to play. Perfect. All right. Uh, now going to the next question, basically about someone you shouldn't be one-tricking. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. He Hexcliff? Heathcliff, dude. With the Q there? Yep. Like the cat. Heathcliff. I, You're not familiar I, with the cat Heathcliff? No, Heathcliff I'm not. The cat? I, I'm not either. Holy Jesus. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a matter of time. Like, we haven't had a missed shot reference in like 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm just going to link this to you because it's a pretty famous cat, I thought. But uh, first air date of might... the Heathcliff and the Cadillac Cats was in 1980. Oh, wait, is that the yellow cat with the purple hat? It, no. 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 No, that's Top Cat. That is Top uh, Cat. It's also one of our patrons. Yeah, <laughs> Heathcliff is uh, a orange cat. Looks a lot like Garfield. It's not Garfield. And uh, yeah, does he like lasagna? Do what? Does he no, like he doesn't lasagna? have a fascination with lasagna. It's, uh, does I, he? Does he uh, have a dog named Odie? He does not. He does <laughs> okay. Not. Now there are some. Is he in a movie differences. where he's oddly animated while everything's in real real life? Uh, <laughs> nope, nope. There's some subtle differences Still there, too. Garfield? All right. <laughs> but uh, he did have a, a couple of seasons of a TV show that was pretty, me- like, pretty mediocre. It wasn't Meow-yoker. really all that great. But, like, Meow-yoker. for some reason, yes. that was a famous cat. I had a Heathcliff book from the book fair that I got in elementary. Mm-hmm. So that's Maybe it's a Missouri thing. For real. No, it's not a Missouri it's, thing. It's probably just a Missouri <laughs> thing. You know? Mel probably. Blanc voiced Heathcliff. That's a true story. <laughs> It, the animated TV series Heathcliff, aka Heathcliff and the Cadillac Cats, debuted on September fifth, nineteen eighty four. So I was one year old when that came out. Oh, I know this cat. No, I see it. It ran in syndication. This sounds like Garfield. I think you just explained Garfield. Eighty six episodes. So, yeah, that it was around. So <laughs> now that the tangent of Heathcliff podcast is over let's talk no, about that's, our favorite that's exactly what it is but it's heathcliff with a q instead of <laughs> all right so heathcliff is asking a question about yasuo so i don't play yasuo so i don't know someone's gonna have to carry this question but he writes in asking or saying hello i am a relatively new player and i would greatly appreciate if you were to talk about how to carry a team better how to carry a team better i play a lot of yasuo and almost always win my lane but I find I'm still losing. So there's a ton of questions. Maybe we'll just go through them one by one. Uh, actually, let's, let's touch on that one. How do you carry your team better just in general? And then we can kind of get into, like, as Yasuo, how do you carry your team better? Well, uh, pushing your lead onto other lanes is a big one. If you're actually, like, winning your lane every single game, which is something that I ran into when I was – a lower elo as I was winning, winning my lane a lot, but I wasn't always translating it to a win. Uh, a really good piece of advice that I kind of took to heart from a streamer was take the loss in your lane at times, like a loss of minions or a loss of uh, turret damage to go help your other lanes. Because if you really believe that you're that much better than your lane opponent, you can go back there with a slight deficit and make that back up. Mm. So take the disadvantage in your lane and go help someone else in their lane because maybe if your laners are either even or ahead of their lanes, you can deal with the disadvantage you've taken from yours. So if you really are winning every single lane, that's like you need to be pushing that onto other lanes and really helping them out. Make roams at weird times make tp plays at weird times because if you really are that much better than your late opponent you'll be able to make up the deficit afterwards yeah you're not just trying to beat one person in the game you're trying to beat five other people so yeah go into the jungle safely at the right time go into the jungles invade steal camps roam teleport all that kind of stuff uh there's definitely some champions that just don't team fight like i think a heimerdinger that always wins land because just the enemy enemy uh champion can't do anything but a Heimerdinger doesn't necessarily bring something into a fight unless they're like 
prepared or they really know how to play hybriding you know yeah it's not a good team fighter same thing with fiora fiora is a really great duelist but not necessarily a great team fighter um yasuo i think is a pretty decent team fighter but i think he kind of runs in the same thing as fiora like he needs a team fight to be set up properly or he needs like other people to engage and do things that he can't do because he's too squishy to do it and yeah, then he, he just wrecks fights yeah yasuo is very a uh, high risk, high reward kind of champion. If you hit a really good knock up in the team fight and you get a big alt, you can really turn the t fight for your team. But if you go in too early, you're still really squishy. You can get focused down and die really fast. So yeah. you really, like Yasuo specifically, you really have to learn your limits on him of, okay, right now the ADC is open. I can go in. And like when you're getting to late game with Yasuo, you're like one or two autos on an ADC and they're getting to less than half health. Like you can absolutely chunk ADCs with the Yasuo crit build. Mm -hmm. But if you go in too early and you get CC'd before you can do that, you can also die really fast. So it's a You're really, squishy. yeah, it's a really weird balance of, I need to be in the fight, but I can't go too early or I'll just get killed. Gotcha. Um, so going a little bit as far as, as first question on this is how to extend my lead to teammates like alec mentioned just go into other lanes and yeah go help your teammates uh mm -hmm. i would say when you're doing that make sure you're roaming correctly how you want to set up a roam is you if possible you push your wave into the enemy turret so they miss xp and then they have to push from their turret to your turret so it's a long way to get there uh, so while you're doing that you go roam down the river or into the enemy jungle jungle if it's safe and ping 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 um since you're a new player i'm guessing you're in bronze or maybe silver five that's where you usually new players land after they do uh placement matches i don't know if that's the your case or not. ps says ps i'm in bronze oh there you go ps okay. he's in bronze uh you're gonna ping like 12 times until your pings get muted Sometimes they won't see that. That's just the unfortunate thing about bronze games, silver games, gold games, play. That just sometimes happens, right? But if they do see that, they can do something about that, right? They can help set up the wave and make sure they're not pushing. They can, uh, you know, hit their CC so you can get in and get, uh, close the gap. They can flash forward and CC so you can close the gap. Like, there's all these things that can happen. So don't just go into a lane expecting your laners to be aware of what's going on. Because it just doesn't happen, especially in low elo where map awareness is up pretty low. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I would also say, like, the the question is, like, how do I fight when getting camped by a jungler? Or how do I, how should I be split pushing? I'm going to answer these together because they're essentially the same question. You do it with vision and you pay attention to your mini map. And you can actually, like... In bronze, it doesn't work so well, but you can predict key points, particularly early on, that you're at a high risk for being ganked. So we'll start here. If the enemy, if you're a top laner and the enemy jungler starts on bot lane, you'll know because their ADC and support will come to lane late because they helped leash, right? Mm -hmm. Then you should be looking at a time window of three to four minutes, particularly three minutes and 30 seconds that's when a jungler will naturally make their way to your side and be ready to gank you. So you need to make sure you have ward coverage up for that window of time. And uh, you want to make sure that you're not, like your wave isn't in a spot where it's too far forward, right? Mm -hmm. If you are getting ganked a lot, you may be hard pushing your wave when you shouldn't be, like constantly jamming the wave into tower or your enemy, is, you're allowing them to freeze the wave right in front of tower. You know, mm. something like that that puts you beyond middle of the river or further, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that may be what your problem is. But to answer that, vision is the way you beat that. Vision is also the way that you safely split push. You can only split push well if you're constantly keeping an eye on your mini map to say like, okay, well, I saw these two bottoms, so they're not going to be a problem for me. I saw the jungler was a dragon and, you know, the mid laner was also a dragon. So 
best case scenario, they bring on a 1v1. I can beat that, right? So you keep pushing. But then you see that the mid has disappeared. And then you count to 10 because they're in the middle of the map and they're going to be walking towards you, right? You also have to be thinking, how far am I from safety right now? Because if you are two towers deep because you've destroyed the first tower and you're on the second one, you're a 15 second run from being safe mm -hmm. or longer. So you need to leave 15 seconds before somebody cuts you off. Yeah. So, right? okay. I have, so, I mean, I wanna... these are, these are considerations that you need to make and you have to have vision properly set up to give you that early warning system. And the deeper you go, the further that vision needs to be. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, I want to bring up something slightly controversial that we may have some disagreements on in bronze. Do you really think vision is super important? Yes. The reason why I say this is because people might not be looking at the map. You put down wards, but even you as a support main might not be watching the wards. Uh, so what, what benefit do you get from them? Okay. I would say in general, the value of vision and bronze is really bad. And I mean, I'm not trying to jam bronze players. I didn't develop a lot of vision control until like, or like paying attention to vision and looking at the map and things like that. I still have issues with it and I'm a diamond. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, it is not a skill I even really truly attempted to develop until late gold. Mm -hmm. And it was what helped propel me through plat whenever I spent time to really focus on it in bronze somebody can be on your screen and you don't see them, <laughs> right? I mean, that can just happen. So yeah, of yeah. course the value of vision is less, but that being said, I'm talking specifically in the scope of you are split pushing. So you need to set up and look at your own vision that you mm -hmm. have set up, right? Mm -hmm. You have set up early warning tripwires. You need to watch them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So, if, it, yeah. So in that context, I'm assuming that this is not the average bronze player. You're going to be looking at what you have done, right? That, that's a little bit different. Because you're right. going to get out of bronze. You're going to get to silver and gold, man. That's, yeah, that's right, baby cakes. And if you feel that you are the player that you're good enough to split push, then vision is your problem, right? It's not about whether bronze vision is worth it. You have no business split pushing if you're not willing to deal with vision because that is such a huge part of it that's part of like if you if someone comes up to me and says hey i need to learn how to split push it's like all right well how is your warding it's like if your map is completely dark you can split push all you want you're gonna get caught off guard well you can split push about safely that. about 10 feet from your tower yeah your map <laughs> is dark yeah it's vision is just a part of split pushing and if you're not willing to work on that which also i could understand like split pushing might not want to be your main focus as a bronze player because the other problem with split pushing is it does rely on your teammates to mm -hmm. make good decisions and guess what teammates don't do even when you get to plat even when you get to diamond teammates don't you can't control their decisions they will make bad decisions Mm -hmm. So split pushing is, I mean, you see pro players fuck up split pushing. Like the pro scene, there's a lot, like the one, I think it was season five where TSM was really set on having Hanser split push. He played a lot of Jace. He played a lot of champions who should have been split pushing and they messed it up a ton. They lost games they should not have lost because they were trying to split push. And this is a pro team messing it up. Split pushing is not easy. It takes a lot of moving parts, hitting the right moments at the right time. Mm -hmm. So, well, it's also like you have to have an uneasy confidence because you are leaving the rest of the map vulnerable. Yep. Whenever you do it and you better be doing it for something that's worth it. Right? Like no. I saw, I was playing a game the other day. And a Twitch was bot lane, and we were taking Baron, and we end up 
fighting a team fight, 5v4s, they try to stop us on Baron. We kill all four of them. We get the Baron, but Twitch took all the way to the inhibitor. That's a really good split push, right? You mm -hmm. traded Baron mm -hmm. for three towers, and you almost got the inhibitor. <laughs> like, yeah. GG, good job. So that's fair, but if that had been more decisive or more fast, or if we had a teleport up at the time, that would not have turned out the same. Yeah. And, yeah. or if, you know, somebody had been paying attention to their damn map and just said, Hey, Twitch has taken two towers. Let's somebody, one of us recall. Cause we don't all four or all five need to kill Baron. Right. Mm -hmm. Then we could have mm -hmm. stopped it earlier. But like, I feel like plans, that are intended to take advantage of like the enemy team is great. Like the enemy team's deficiency. Those are great plans. But if that also requires your team to have a proficiency in bronze, I don't think that's a great plan anymore. See, th that's the main problem I have with it. You can play that split push perfectly as a split pusher. You can do everything you're supposed to do. You can have the vision out. You push your lane at the right time. You can 1v1 the person that's against you in lane. And that split push can still go wrong. Your team can still do something on the other side of the map that completely negates what you're trying to do. Ooh, and ooh. even better, you can tilt the shit out of your team because they're going to lose a 4v5 <laughs> and they're not going to yep. realize that you're there. And they're going to be like, where the fuck were you, Twitch? And it's like, well, I just took three towers. And they're going to be like, I don't right. care, you're a dick. Come team fight. And then yep. they're going to throw. Yep. So there's just so many factors in the split pushing that just, it's very hard to make it work at the right times. I, I strongly say, like, work on other parts. There's so many other parts of your game that you are not doing it. None of us play every part of the game at 100%. So there's probably so many different parts of this game that you can get better at to like make you a better player that doesn't require one that needs like your teammates to play well. Yeah, I, I do think you can test the waters a little bit. Like if you yeah. realize after you you know you pushed a little further and you realize that oh they're not res the enemy team's not responding correctly to you and they send up two people and you can kill two people it, like doesn't matter because you're fed from laning phase. Like test the waters a little bit and see what happens because maybe your team does know how to play okay at it and because you're so fed when they send two people up or three people up or they keep sending five people one by one to you and like it can work out because you you also confuse the enemy team in a macro that they don't know how to deal with as well yeah okay, so, let me let me middle ground this waters, bitch. you test waters i think i can middle ground this bitch mm -hmm. instead of you split pushing set your wave and let it go and then rotate to your team so, like, set it up to where your minion wave slightly outnumbers theirs, and it's going to grow and grow and grow and become a huge wave, and then join your team. Because yeah. you'll set a sixth man on the map, and your five can 5v5. They won't know to deal with that, because they won't see somebody actively pushing the wave until it hits their tower. And then they'll be like, oh, crap, it hit our tower. What are we going to yeah. do? And at that point, it's too late. And I, I think even you can you can even set up a slow push top lane and then go split push mid heavily and then go bot lane teams like about to fight. And you're Yasuo, so you don't necessarily be, have to be there at the start of the fight unless okay, you have like Sam, a Malphite ultimate. Remember, Bronze, if you are out of a lane, if you're in top lane long enough to set it and then you go mid long enough to push it, your team has already died. <laughs> I don't. I mean, if you're the first one out, like, there's there's opportunities to do this. And I'm, like, I'm just saying, like you're talking about a very rare circumstance in which you'd be able to effectively pull that off. I don't think so. But then again, a lot of us haven't been in bronze for a long time. We might be a little out of touch with it, you know. So you use your use your best judgment, I would say. But I I think for the most part, push, split pushing is very hard to do, and it's probably yeah. not. I don't like it. Yeah, I don't like that approach to depending on split pushing to win a game. Yeah, I like I'm a diamond top main and I struggle with split pushing like 100%. My champion is good at split pushing and I still at times struggle with it. It is very hard timing wise and it's just very difficult. So I have no problem with like test it out, try it, but 
I think you'll see more success if you help bolster your team up, like straight from the source, just going to your team and helping them as a team rather than helping them around the map because they won't take advantage of the macros and like opportunities they get from split push as much as they will just from, hey, we're all here and we fought and we Yep. All right. So one of the other questions he talks about is how to prioritize objectives and towers. This is a big question, <laughs> and it's not it's not that uh, straightforward. But let's let's do our best to answer this one. Okay. So uh, what what now? How to prioritize objectives and towers? Is that what you said? Yeah, or what objective slash tower should I prioritize? All of them. <laughs> well, no, not all. I, mean, I don't let's, like, let's talk about the hierarchy. There's okay. okay. The nexus. Yeah, do the, the hierarchy. One, yeah, the one is the nexus. You always want to go from the nexus. Two is inhibitors. inhibitors two nexus turrets well okay next even no nope, i wouldn't even put nexus turrets there because nexus turrets are easier to take down if the inhibitors are down so i okay. would say we don't take the take the inhibitors down and then after inhibitor you would have to go for baron is number mm -hmm. four and then five you have inner turrets or okay. inhibitor turrets, sorry. Holy cow, <laughs> running out of things here. Then six would be inner turrets. And then set last but not least are the outer turrets. But that's kind of, I think you would put, what, first turret and then dragon and then yeah. outer turrets. Yeah. And that's kind maybe, of a huge... And Rift Carol probably bounces in there too with the outer turrets depending yeah. on what's on the map and how the, how the game's going. Yeah. But then again, also... You only need to take down four turrets to win the game, right? If you went just mid lane <laughs> or top lane. So, yeah, it's it's tricky because you have this hierarchy, right? And ideally, yeah, you could take out three inhibitors. Sometimes you don't need to do that because I've seen players, like, swing off from inhibitor to inhibitor to then the third inhibitor. I'm like, no! And the game. the game right now. I'm like, oh. Yeah. Like, you see that happen. But so when it comes to prioritizing, you know, the goal is to win the game, right? To take down the Nexus. What, what is a path to do that, right? Sometimes it's like, I can't get that inhibitor turret, so that means I need to get Baron. Like, that's what you think. Or it's like, hey, we have a difficult... We don't have good sieging comps, but there's a lot of mountain drakes this game. We should prioritize those, because that makes getting objectives easier, you know? So you have to think about this and what's important, you know? A lot of times people are like, Dragon's really, really important. But it's a win, Drake, and their jungler is beating your jungler. Maybe we don't want to fight a dragon because it's not worth the risk when we can take a top turret and a rift herald instead when they go to dragon. So um, it's really tricky. Uh, anything else to add to that one? I mean, there's just so many different parts of the league. Like, games will it'll always be... Uh, in the moment decision about what's going on, but I would say you really have to try in, in your next games, if you're struggling with objective control, try to critically, every time you get even one kill, ob critically think about, okay, what objective can we take from this? What objective comes next? Because the more you think about it in each game and like really mull it over, like it'll become second nature as like you play more and get used to it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Next one. Should I be TPing back to my lane or looking for TP ganks? <laughs> We're really hitting all these subjects. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's really about the here and now of playing the game, you know? <laughs> Should you TP back to lane? I don't know. Is there a giant mini wave that if you miss, you'll be behind in experience and that level will really hurt you in lane? Or is your enemy jungler in the bot lane and if you TP there, you can turn around a gank? Like, those are things that change, like, from game to game. And we've kind of, we've talked about it before on this podcast. There's so many different situations that can come about and... You really, like, I would say after, let's say, probably around, like, 10 minutes, maybe even earlier than that, you start to hit a point where TPing back to a lane is not worth it. 
But yeah. you want to be using your TP to give a numbers advantage around that. I I see. I I almost rather would talk about like when not to TP back into your lane because <laughs> it tilts me so much when we're like pushing bot lane. We want to fight. We're pushing to the next turret, and then my top laner goes to TP to his outer turret at 35 minutes that has very little health to save it from a wave that's about to hit and probably won't take. I'm like, no one cares about that outer turret right now when we can get an inhibitor yeah. turret or an inhibitor or a dragon. Um, TPing back in the lane to get farm is only necessary when you need to get that experience at farm. Like, That's an you're, early game thing. If you're, Yeah, it's an early game thing. The, for, yeah, super, super important. Unless you're saving like your inhibitor, like, no, just back lose some cs lose that farm and walk into lane because what's going to be more important in mid game is not you getting a wave of minions it's going to be more you securing the ace because you tp in or turning a fight at baron because you have your tp available those kind of things are more important um but also uh heathcliff saying that i win my lane often then who cares about your lane go to other lanes right yeah, so, if you're running your lane, use that TP to get to other lanes. I think people really underestimate TPing to other lanes, especially in situations when your teammates get out and you can even that playing field. Even if you end up, especially in a bronze situation, if you end up in a situation where, oh, I TP'd and they weren't fighting in that exact moment, like maybe stick around a little bit. Someone's probably going to fight again. People are very aggressive in lower <laughs> elos because and honestly in all elos people want to fight it's it's a video game at the end of the day people like the fun part is finding the other champions no one wants to just sit under tower and for minions there's no minion simulator out there that's doing better than league of legends everybody wants to fight champions so yeah, yeah. like people get over aggressive people get baited into bad situations so i it's always better to pull the trigger on being with your team and being in a situation rather than like holding off and being just being passive about it. And we've, that's another thing we've talked about on this podcast a lot is passive play. Passive play doesn't win games. Aggressive play does. So if you're holding that TP is, Oh, this isn't the perfect TP or this isn't exactly the right say, time. Uh, passive aggressive play doesn't win games either. <laughs> <laughs> Just get you reported. Yeah, just get you reported. What's wrong, Thresh? Nothing. I'm fine. Nothing. Dot, dot, dot. You're fat. Dot, dot, dot's the worst. I mean, it's cool. Don't worry about it. You're doing great. Okay. All right. All right. Question mark, ping, question mark, ping, question mark, ping. I just think it's funny. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, he's right. Uh, I derailed him, but aggressive. You want you want to play and take <laughs> advantage of things and push, you know, push your advantages. But that doesn't mean just like butt fucking your lane over and over and over again. That means butt fucking every lane over and over yeah. and over again. You gotta yeah. get yeah, the love. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Last question from Heathcliff. How do I fight when getting camped by the enemy jungler? <laughs> don't you don't I, I think i already <laughs> answered this when i talked about split pushing it's the same shit it's it's yeah. just you put on the vision so that you know that you are safe to play aggressive you watch the map so you know like hey i saw the jungler bottom i can play aggressive right now and nothing bad will happen you know before you look at an all in glance down at the mini map and see if you see their mid laner because mm -hmm. if their mid laner is mia you don't want to do that right now because it has a high potential to go just terrible. I mean, unless you can delete them in a quarter second, then just go ahead and delete them. Yeah, if you can 2v1, then that's great. Bring them yeah. up. Right? Or if you can 2v1, that's cool too. But you need to be prepared to do some crazy mechanical shit rather mm -hmm. than like diving into them and be like, well, I guess I'm 2v1ing now. Yeah. yeah. Like you have to go into that with like somewhat of a plan at least, generally speaking. But. How do you fight when getting camped by the jungler? Know where the jungler is. Uh, or, like, let's say you go push your wave, right? Don't just put that easy, lazy ward in the river. Put a ward, like, go all the way down to their blue buff and drop a ward between their blue buff and their gromp. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to know where they are. Or do the same thing for red. 
Because if they're going to come towards you to gank, they're probably not just going to ignore their entire jungle and run straight down the river. Yeah. The other thing I would say is uh, don't be lazy with wave management. Because almost everyone below Diamond is lazy with wave management. Like In low Diamond, when... people are lazy with wave management. Yes, that too. Pretty much everywhere people are lazy with wave management. If you really take your time to CS, like try some time when you're in lane to only last hit. Technically, if you're only last hitting, the wave should never move out of the middle of the lane. It should keep hitting the middle of the lane at the same time. But people aren't patient, so the enemy is probably going to end up pushing that wave at extra auto attacks or extra abilities. And how much easier is it to stay away from ganks when the minions are coming to your tower instead of the yeah. pushing under the enemy tower? So just one game. Well, okay, wait, wait. I do want to. I do want to push this. Uh, not only is it easy to stay away from ganks, but it's also really easy to zone out your opponent whenever you're way ahead. Because the one thing I see in like lower elos is like I'm way ahead. I'm just gonna clear the minion and push it into tower. Ha ha ha! That's the mm -hmm. last thing you want to do. You want to freeze the wave right outside your tower and then stand on the other side of the wave. So it's like, hey, I'm way ahead. If you want to get to this wave or even get within exp range of this wave, come through me, bitch. I will kill you. I'll cut you. I will yeah. cut you. <laughs> you know. That's kind of the stand that you want to make is mm -hmm. I control this wave. I control it so much that you can't even come near it or I will kill you, yeah. which then you deprive the other team of not only a source of income, but you freeze out their top laner and his ability to even stay with you at all. And then if you get 2v1, you can actually win that because your mm -hmm. opponent has no levels. Yeah. Like, yeah, I... if you've ever in League of Legends tried to kill somebody that has a two-level advantage on you, it doesn't ever happen. <laughs> yeah, it's really difficult. Levels mean a lot stat-wise. So, I mean, and... that's, that's how you really put the boot on somebody's neck. So, if you're telling me that you win lane every game, or, like, you win lane way more often than you lose it, these are the things you're not doing. Yeah. yeah. I would say with wave management... Learn it in three steps. The first step is learn how waves move. Learn exactly how to wave management. So where you know there's... When you look at the minions on the map, you know which way it's going to push in the next two minutes. When you get a feel for that and you understand the kind of ebb and flow of the minion waves, now get to the point where uh, Blake was talking about, where you know how to get it in front of your turret and you're standing between their minions and them. So they have a really hard time getting to their minions. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you do that enough and get really good at it, you can do the ultimate BM, which is go and freaking uh, proxy their waves because you're so much stronger. <laughs> that is the ultimate point of I have won this lane and I dare your jungler to come up here and try to help. Yeah, like That's a very rare occurrence. But if you practice your wave management enough and how well you control like the experience that gets to your enemy, like you can get to that point. I've gotten to that point in games, and it's a ton of fun. But it's a very rare occurrence. But it shows, like it takes a lot of time, and it just it'll take your game to a whole another level. Wave management is what took me from plat to diamond. Like wave management is what made me just crush plats in lane and just completely climb through platinum like it was nothing yeah yeah, yeah wave, wave management, management is what made him a real boy <laughs> <laughs> turn from a boy to a man yeah it wasn't one... that no lying bullshit it was wave management <laughs> from one little crocodile to a giant alligator Dude, this dude <laughs> lies his ass off still a real boy <laughs> <laughs> wave management. blake is pointing at his little little boy um the last thing I want to say about this is I want to talk about the the misconception about being camped and that being a bad thing. Um, if you if you know who Apto is, he's considered like one of the best players in the world that actually doesn't play competitively. He's a Korean solo queue player. He's really, really good. He puts out videos. He always pu puts his lane and always puts himself in a position where he's trying to draw the jungler into gank. 
The reason is that he will escape that gank and he's wasting that jungler's time. So if you're if the jungler's coming up to you, and if you're able to learn actually like how to draw them and never like realize if I go past this point, I will die. Or it's like I don't have flash, so I will die if I go here, or I can push this far, draw the jungler, and then back off where I know where the jungler is gonna be, so I can back off a little early and waste the jungler's time. That is a huge way to help your team. That's like it's a completely invisible thing that you're doing for your teammates, but it is absolutely huge. So if you're getting camped, like embrace that know that it's going to happen and then just like waste the jungler's time because then he's camping a lane that you're behind so who cares like what is he doing helping helping make you fall even more behind when you're behind like it's worse when he goes gank the mid your mid laner and then your mid laner is zero and three and you have a fed Z on your team or something like that when you're like oh i was three and zero now the Z is six and zero and now we lose because of my bad mid laner well if you're able to pull enemy jungler's attention to your lane, that is helping everyone else on the map as long as you play it correctly. And that, that's also hard. It requires a lot of knowledge and understanding the jungle, jungle and good warding and stuff like that and good timing. But another thing to think about. Cool. Um, that was a lot of information. It sure was. So much information. <clears throat> let's, <laughs> let's, I'm going to take a break a little bit. Uh... Alec Worm got something in the mail recently. He got a new mic, if you haven't noticed. I did. It I... Uh, ho hopefully sounds great because it is the first time testing it, and that was part of the technical difficulties that got us late, and who knows <laughs> what the recording is going to sound like. Hopefully I think it's nice and crispy. Yeah, nice and crispy. There you go. Maybe not nice and crispy. Maybe like soft and smooth, soft and silky might soft be a little better smooth. for your voice. I don't know. I don't... Yeah. Let's see. But thank you so much for all the patrons that donated to basically make that happen. We actually bought yeah, many thanks, of my guys. two this, uh, this month because I bought Worm his for December and then using, or I guess technically November patrons and then December patrons helped pay for Manny's mic. So that was super, super helpful. Thank you guys so much. Um, we need to figure out a way to uh, get Worm a <laughs> mic stand though or something yeah. because it doesn't I work can... on his desk. I can figure something out. I'm really not worried about it. I've got tools and stuff like that. I can, I can figure something. I just, I only spent all of like a half hour really trying at it. So I, it's really that I don't have the materials at my disposal right now. I'll get, I'll get my dad to help me out and we'll get something set up really nice. Yeah. So now, um, Alec will always sound great. Or, uh, Manny may or may not still talk over people. I'm not sure that's going to happen still. You even got him a new microphone. It's supposed to uh, set off an alarm when he attempts to talk over <laughs> so a shot it actually <laughs> just cut, actually just cuts him off. He also wears a shot collar. Just... <laughs> it also keeps him in the yard. <laughs> you got... yeah. We had this real issue with uh, we were trying to do podcasts and Manny would be like out in the street playing. And it's like, dude, come on. We got to record. So give him a little zap. Let him know he needs to die, You know. Yeah, it'd be great. So, no, seriously, thank you guys so much for helping us make that possible. Now we all, it's really cute. We all have matching mics now. It's absolutely adorable. The cutest. Yeah, the cutest. Um, uh, Blake, how are you doing, buddy? I was super. I was uh, shopping for women's ski boots. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> while you guys were talking about I I've kind of blacked out on the whole mics thing, and then I realized that... Uh, my wife uh, ordered some ski boots, and they were a little too small, so she wanted me to order another pair, and I forgot to do that. That's right. You're going to uh, Colorado in like yeah, a few yeah. Weeks, we're going right? to Winter Park. That's, that's going to be super fun. Yeah, that's Winter Park is super nice. I've been there before. It's a lot of. Fun. I'm going out to Vail this uh, March. So. Oh God. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can. Uh, this is going to be Max's first ski time. How old Ooh. is Max? He is four. Ooh, that was when I started right too. It's like yep. the perfect age to break a bone, you know. You know. Yeah, I mean, his bones <laughs> are all rubbery at this point. It'll be. <laughs> He's so young. Car. He won't Do realize what? how scared he is. He's so young. Like when I started, when I was four, years old, like I started and I started doing like black diamonds and stuff. And then when like I turned like eight, I like stopped doing black diamonds because I like got that like old enough that I realized that things are scary. Yeah, and then like at. Hurt. <laughs> and it, it came full circle again that yeah. I got uh, better at a different time. Uh, yeah, that's funny. I had a... Um... <laughs> <Okay. laughs> 
listeners can't hear this because Blake muted one of his mics, but not the other. So we can hear Max saying. You can only hear it on stream. You're, yeah, you're only. Good. You're good in Zen. Which is also part of our video podcast, which we're trying to push our YouTube channel, you know, to better quality and all that stuff. But, you know, whatever. Not a big deal. Um, my sister, I think she was probably eight at the time or around that age, maybe six or something. She was, like, great at skiing. And she would just shoot down the mountain, just shoot <laughs> down straight. No, like, no turning, no, like, you know, no pizza slices or anything, just going straight down. And I remember this one time we got down the hill. Be- me and my dad got down the hill before my sister, and we looked up, just going right past. And we, you know, the ski lifts, mm-hmm. you know, they're in the middle of the slopes. She just zips by one, like, barely missing it. And then there's a wooden fence, and she's, like, right next to it. She just reached out her arm. She could touch it. And then she goes all the way down. We're, like, hearts are, like, racing. And she's, like, oh, that was fun. Like, Liz, do you not see the things you almost ran to? She's, like, what are you talking about? She's completely oblivious in, like, her little adrenaline high or whatever. <laughs> the six-year-old. It was terrifying. She was going, like, 40 miles per hour at least, I feel like. She was booking it, but. Yeah. yeah. Max we'll will be see. Fine. I mean, it, Max <laughs> is not like well known for his responsibility, and yeah. his mom is not very good at skiing either. So we'll see what happens. Uh, they're gonna take the classes with you ski like pizza, you go French fries, pizza, yeah. French yeah, fries. Yeah. And they're gonna do that, and then I'm probably gonna take him down the slopes and make sure he doesn't die. And, have a leash? Huh? Yeah, that's gonna work. <laughs> yeah what, like, what can go wrong with like yeah what could go wrong with making a train rope. out of this like, <laughs> you know they always say if something's unstable attach it to something else like yeah. no that's how it works no like son and mother fall off cliff takes unsuspecting father with them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> father on leash dies harder <laughs> yeah. the ground faster and harder Somehow, wife and son live, though. <laughs> Somehow, wife and son live. Father dies horribly. <laughs> Impaled by son's ski. <laughs> the real question. And by the rope. <laughs> yeah. Would have lived, but for rope. Um, <laughs> the other question is, will he be tall enough to get on this? Because when I first started, I was so small that my dad literally had to lift me onto the ski lift when we were growing. Oh, we'll so. have to. I mean, he, he is a super tall four-year-old. But, like, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to. Uh, I have this shot put him onto it. I don't really, like, <laughs> Yeah, that's what my dad did. He I'll just do it and then jump up. after and be like, okay, we got this. Uh, I'm Max, meet you at the top gonna... of the hill. Take off your skis and climb. Yeah, I, just, I don't know what he's going to do about Oh, I got it. My wife and I can just stand and, like, each grab an arm. Perfect. There you go. And then we can just kind of lean back into it. And then Retractable leash. I'm telling you. (laughs) Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, then you can just lock (laughs) it, lock it, and then pull him up by the leash. (laughs) There you go. You can put him in a harness. Yeah, because there are no trees underneath the ski lift. Well, like, listen, you're talking dangling. semantics. Really, really not, bad idea. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you're dangling him into off. a ski pinata. It's just a not poor ass chairlift. I'm just saying to get him up initially, just pull on the harness and then place him on the chair. Right. Yeah. If yeah, you don't, not, don't, don't dangle him. You're not, like, risking his life here. Just, like, what would a good father do? Come on. Ski noose. That, <laughs> you know, would, with a good snap to it, you want to have some spongy cord that you know just has a lot of good pullback. Maybe some rubbery, right? So that way, well, whenever he does die, it'll at least be quick. <laughs> God damn, you guys I don't are not think... parents. Fatherhood is so hard. Yeah, it's just, it's... I mean, everything I said made sense. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like we would make great parents. I feel like Blake is has so many parents terrible ideas i mean it's like he hasn't even been a parent he he just doesn't care the fact that one of my kids made it to four (laughs) this is not little house in the prairie times blake (laughs) yeah i think you don't realize how much it still is like your kids will actively try to kill themselves you really have to stop them (laughs) they don't realize what they do that they could just it could all be over soon like okay So I was at my in-laws' house, and uh, Mick was trying to jam something metal into an outlet. 
And my mother-in-law was literally standing three feet away and froze. And she's like, somebody stop him. I'm like, you're three <laughs> feet away. So I jumped to the couch and my wife like ran over there and we all grabbed him and pulled him back. But it was like, like, yeah, they literally try to just off themselves constantly. Blake. It's a testament to your parenthood that they would just rather end it all. Then like, like spend one more Christmas me, day my family. But Blake, you know what the perfect solution for that situation would have been? A leash. Uh, a leash, right? Yeah, because sure. just yanked him off of it. <laughs> the leash is gonna be my parenting parenting tool. Yeah, a leash, a bark collar, maybe a box to shit in in the corner. You know? So what you're oh. saying is you really just want to get a dog. Yeah, just get a dog, or you can do that. <laughs> or a well, cat. Blake, you know, Blake, as yeah. a person that doesn't have a child, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but as a support main, I do feel like I have a child a lot <laughs> in the game. Which leads us right. to our next question from Agile Otter, a new AD carry player. So, he writes in a few questions, so we'll try to get through them as quick as we can, or as thoroughly and quickly as we can. What AD carry champs would you recommend for his aggressive play style? Lucian, uh, Caitlyn. Uh, wow, I'm blanking. I need these Draven's right a good there. one if you can do the mechanic. Draven. But that's, yeah. that's, Draven's hard. I, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say no on Draven. Yeah, if you're new to the game and you're having to... Don't add in the axe hmm. factor. I he said say. new to AD carry, though. I don't know if he's new to the game. I don't think he's new to the game. He's been playing... Okay. Actually, yeah. I don't know who this guy is. He's been playing for a while, but he's been on and off. So I don't know how "quote unquote" good he is, but yeah, Draven is a tough ch champion to play. So I, it's not maybe the best yeah. recommendation, but okay. Draven is definitely an aggressive way to carry. I would yeah. say Misfortune, Lucian, Tristana, Caitlyn. Yeah, I like that list. Yeah, I think Sivir could also pass yeah. on that list. Yeah, and I think if you're learning, I think Lucian is favorite. Because Lucian gets into a lot of, like, he has the mechanical, like, you can play him to a point that you're hitting all the damage you possibly can. You do a ton of damage. But also, if you end up, like, not doing everything perfectly, he still has a lot of damage early. It's, like, really easy to just kind of, when your support hits a CC, you jump in and deal damage as Lucian and kill the enemy. Really it's quickly. not like really mechanically hard but at the same time if you're very deliberate with every ability on lucian and you weave in those double shot auto attacks he also can be an insanely mechanical champion so yeah. i think he teaches a lot of good habits and it's difficult yeah. he has a short range uh, auto attack range which makes it tricky you know you can get cc'd mm -hmm. but uh yeah i think i think lucian's pretty strong in this meta too I, well he's not like the strongest but he's the the keystones definitely help him they're good. Yeah. Press, press the attack, Lucian, is really good right now. Uh, one of my favorite lanes to play right now is whenever one of my friends plays lane a lot. It's a lot of fun. Nice, nice. All right. Uh, second question. What's the best forum for improving last hitting creeps? Like, for example, practice tool or AI? Okay. Uh, I'm going to quote this old thing that is boring as hell, but if you can do it, you will do really well in terms of CSing. So what you do is the first thing you do is probably go into practice tool and you try to CS until you can get consistently 90% of the minion wave at a certain earmark, right? So you go for five minutes or 10 minutes. I think this was set up for 10 minutes, right? And just do one, try to do the best you can, just last hitting or just making sure that you, you don't have to just last hit, but you make sure you get all the CS you can get, right? And when you get to a 90% mark with no pressure, then you do, uh, you alternate. One wave you freeze, and the next wave you push as fast as you can, right? And you do that until you can get 90%. Then... You add in an AI bot, and you do the same thing. Just no, no pressure. Just get as much CS as you can 
against an AI without dying. And then you do that until you get 90%. Then you do that, freeze one wave, push the next, until you get 90%. Then you do two bots in your lane. And you do the same thing until you can get 90%. Then you freeze, then you push until you can get 90%. And when you can do that with two bots, you don't really need to practice anymore. The rest is going to be game mechanics. Yeah, I think it, it's tough because last hitting is the most boring part of this game. But it is such a core fundamental that everyone needs to know or else you just you really handicap yourself, right? It's like going into a fight with one arm, you know, really, because if you CS well at that dragon fight, you'd have an extra pickaxe going into that fight, or you'd have an extra needlessly large item, or you would actually have that third item completed going to that Baron fight instead of having two and a half items. You know, that's CS, how important CSing is. Yeah, CS is the foundation of the house. Everything yeah. that you build, you build on the ability to CS. Yeah. So if you suck ass at CSing, you're going to have a really shaky foundation and dirt floors. Yeah. yeah. So I will say this. If uh, you try that, it's super boring and it's really tough to do. You should try to do it anyway. Just do it one way. Just go in, do practice one. Just do one wave. Do one wave and then be done. Like do something. And then when you go into an actual game... Don't, don't focus on trading. Focus on CS. Just focus on CS. And it's going to lose you lanes. It's going to lose you games and stuff like that. But if you really don't want to practice in practice tool or co-op versus AI or whatever, just practice it in a real game so it's a little more fun and there's a little more levity and breaks from CSing the whole time. But if you really want to improve on CSing, you have you have to work on it. So don't focus on training. Focus on CSing. And then once you get better at CSing, you could, again, like like Blake was saying, instead of thinking about the bots, like think about the bots as the enemy laners now and you're trading a little bit. But you have to focus on CSing. And the fastest way to do the, improve on that is going into boring practice tool and doing it. The second fastest way is probably going into a game and just focusing on it. But the slowest way, it, obviously the slowest way is just not thinking about it and not working on it. You have to intentionally work on it. And it, it sucks, but that's what you have to do. Hopefully, yeah. Riot will take another game some, sometime. I don't know. <laughs> well, I hope they first, don't do that. <laughs> but you know they're they taking don't... Sidestone out of the game? They, they are. See that. Yeah. Unreal. I really don't like that. Really? I, I, see, I'm actually kind of excited for it. It'll open up it uh, more support slots. Like They can get different itemization. Okay. Okay, 30 second rant. I just want to go on real quick. Time. The, the problem is, yeah, is that, that they've now tied Sightstone and your ability to place vision to completing quests on your main support item, which means that if I need vision earlier, I have now lost agency to be able to buy it with gold if I want it. Now mm -hmm. I have to do something to complete it before I can have it. So I've lost agency. I've lost the ability to choose what I need. Instead, I, if I want, and, and that's to say, well, okay, well, you could buy damage instead. I can do that anyway if I'm ahead. I'll buy damage, <laughs> and I won't feel bad about it one bit if it's, you know, if it's what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I don't need an excuse to buy damage. I'll just buy some fucking damage if that's what needs to be bought, right? If Sidestone needs to be bought, I'll buy that. Mm -hmm. But now I don't have that option. I can't buy it. I have to quest for it. I, I get what you mean, but I also think that I think in general, though, for the most of the time, like this just opens up. Okay, so did you guys listen to the Dive podcast that was released this week? I didn't listen didn't to the not. Dive, but I read the article on the support items. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I don't know the details on it, but I was listening to the Dive and they talked about it where it's like when something is done by everyone because that's the way you have to do it, when you, it's like you have a choice to do it, but really you don't because everyone has to do it that way. That's not a fun mechanic, dude deal with it's nice when you have choices and you can make different choices but ultimately supports always have to build sidestone they're all going to build sidestone so hey let's take that part out of the game save you that 800 gold in building the sidestone or whatever and you just you're going to get it eventually so, okay, so if that means your, it opens it up a little bit if that's but i agree plan. with what you're talking about though well, sure but you can do that cleaner 
So if that's your game plan, just attach that my trinket uh, gives full sight stone for second trinket, right? Or for second level support item. So like if I buy my Targons second level, right? Then mm-hmm. now my trinket can drop as many wards as sight stone. Yeah, that, and then that might be the way. Once I get it. to third level, it gets acclimated in, so I can switch my trinket to a red trinket. Hmm. Yeah. And then I have agency, and I get. I'm still the support. I'm still the vision guy. You know, because they can't figure a way to distribute that across everybody. It has to be the well, support. Well, I mean, no, that's the thing. A lot of junglers are taking support items, though. But sure. again, like, but yeah, this, like there said, might be a better I, way to do it, but I don't. I don't know. Well, like, I don't know the details like enough. Like my problem is. When you, like, just like what they said, okay, so if it's the thing you do, that's the thing you have to do, right? Bull- bullshit. As a support, I had three choices. I could build better boots early on for roaming. I could build sightstone for vision, or I could build into my support item for more damage or utility. I had three real viable options. Or fourth option, I can build real selfish and buy my support needlessly large rod. Yeah. Right? I mean, I could do that. And there were times yeah, yeah, when yeah. that was actually the best decision I made. Mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I and agree so with that. So those were my, like, four legit options. Now, I've lost one of those options. And no matter what, I always get vision at a certain point, regardless of whether I need it or not. And there's certain times when I'm ahead that I know it's going to attract jungle attention. And I know we need more vision coverage to be able to push our advantage. And if I can't elect to buy that, then I have an agency problem. Like, I don't get to play the way I want to. I get pigeonholed Mm -hmm. into something. Right? Granted, yeah, I'll have more damage. So I guess I'll be more dangerous to gank or something. But, you know. It, it, it seems ironic that this is coming from me. You know what I mean? Like, I fully recognize the irony in what I am saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, like, I like the ability to make that choice. It, I could see that you wouldn't want to just make it cheaper, right? Mm-hmm. But you could make it cheaper if you had a support item already. Yeah. Right? Or, you know what I mean? Because yeah. you could do something mm-hmm. like that. And then it's like less of a chunk out of your, out of your bank account as a support because 800 gold Mm -hmm. does suck, but the, what you get for that 800 gold, like nobody would tell you that that purchase isn't worth it. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Well, I think if they make it too cheap, then everyone else can buy it too, but. Well, sure. um, But I mean, that's what I'm saying. Attach it to the support item and then make it cheap. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I don't see that. The other thing is, I really like the functionality of Targons. I really like the functionality of, like, what used to be Shirelia's, you know, the, the coin. Mm-hmm. And spooky ghosts were fun, but outclassed. But they, the they, movement they, speed on that thing was awesome sure, that you got they, from proccing it. That was a nice change. I really enjoyed that change. Yeah, I mean, these were fun items that I used to have. Like, there are so many champions that I ran Face of the Mountain on. Because I could, Thresh, for example, I could give, it shored up a huge problem with Thresh, which is that your shield doesn't shield for shit. Mm -hmm. So I could really peel for an ADC and then give them like a one-time burst of shields with Face of the Mountain and uh, lock it and be sure that they would survive for a while. Yep. I now don't have that. So my agency disappears with that too. And before I used to be able to sacrifice an item slot for an activatable effect, but I feel like Riot just thinks, well, you know, the IO of items are all just better. Nobody would want to buy the other ones anyway, so scrap them. I don't feel like that's true. And I feel like the opportunity Mm. cost of changing all this shit changes a lot of play styles that I have enjoyed. And that's kind of what bothers me about it. It's like the whole thing of how it's implemented is going to shake up a lot of stuff that I think will create problems. And then it's just going to be, we have two mids because that will be the optimum way to play. If I'm completely unfettered or I'll have another Mm -hmm. tank or something. Yeah. But I mean, the two mids play cell work better because you can burst out an ADC. Yeah. yeah, then ADCs will be complaining, and then they'll be building like this Targon fleet of footwork, like all this, 
like yeah, healing I mean, well, and then it just gets really boring to. for them like too. that's the thing is you're gonna have to Dorant shield because if supports are allowed to spend 800 gold into early damage then they will and then that a lost ADCs chapter just don't have the ability to stay alive if they get hit with something yeah i think the lost chapter is 900 900 so it's like right there so then yeah, it's 900 yeah that's that's a lot of gold to getting a that or a chalice or whatever. Well, I mean, shit, you're yeah. 300 gold off. I mean, how many times have I gone back and bought sidestone and boots? That's oh, yeah, that's a gold. Needless. You are almost at a needlessly large rod. They should they should release a support needlessly large rod. That's like a thousand gold. They That'd do. Be great. It's 1250. No, that's I said <laughs> that should be a thousand gold. Oh, I just failed to distinguish that between a support and a regular item. I feel like they. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, this episode's getting a little long now, and we have a few things to catch up on still. Uh, have you have you all had any success with non meta rune builds? Yes. My favorite has been so far watching Barnsey take Predator on NASA's jungle. That's been really fun <laughs> seeing NASA fly into a kill people. <laughs> I mean, dude, there's a lot. And mm -hmm. there's a ton because I don't, the thing is, I don't really feel like there is a meta. That's the, like, it's still too new for there to be like a meta. Everybody's still figuring this stuff out. I mean, mm -hmm. there's stuff that, yeah, right now certain ones are better than others, but that's always true. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, just talking about like the 80 carries, it was, it was uh press the attack, press the attack, press the attack until maybe a week and a half ago when we were like, everyone's like, whoa, whoa, fleet of footwork, fleet of footwork. And then you just get a ton of defensive stuff because you just sustain. Like yeah. that has now, that is now like the 80 carry way to play. Yeah, it definitely can change all over the place. One that I'm, I actually take Grassley and Dying now on Connected. Like everyone was talking about Electric Q and like press the attack, like, haha, it gives him more damage and everything. And I started running, um, Grassy Undying with uh, one of like the subsets is a uh, uh, overgrowth, I think it's called, that you get health like minion like Inside. dying near you. Yeah, and it's like at first it seems kind of negligible, but if you have whenever you hit someone with a Grassy Undying proc, you get a certain amount of health, like max health, and whenever oh, you oh. get a minion dying near you, you get a max health. So suddenly, when you're in lane on Renekton. Like, I've been sometimes foregoing, I go Ravenous Hydra instead of Titanic because I have a deficient amount of health from these two items. Yeah, or yeah. Or these two ruin sets. So it's like, it gives me a nice little buff there of health. And I feel like a lot of people were kind of overlooking that because it is very small. Like, I'm not going to say that it's like, oh, it's so strong. You get so much. It is small, but, like, as you start getting into the mid and late game, it starts to hit that, like, health like item worth of health kind of range gotcha cool so i think i think like what blake said trial a ton like there's no real meta right now isn't like it's hard to say like if you're playing off meta stuff because there isn't really a meta yeah <laughs> just wait so till like week three of lcs and the meta will be established or something yeah that's for sure so you got like a month like <laughs> do you have a favorite off meta or a weird rune build right now like a weird one, like sure. Or what? Well, the, the problem is in support. Everything kind of, it. I mean, there really isn't. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's like, okay, well, do you go like comet or do you go airy? And it's pretty clear when you do that. Do you have a shield? Yeah. Go airy. Do you have any kind of ability to do anything with a slow? Go comet. Do you have a three hit thing and that's what your your guy is? Go electrocute. Right? It's more about like dicking with your secondary tree in support. Right? You're uh, sure. Okay. So like okay, so for example, I made a Shin page. I've been playing a, a buttload of Shin support, which whenever I do decide to do this off meta support thing, he's gonna be like top of the list, like real good right mm -hmm. but uh as shin support i've tried uh the resolve tree with aftershock i think is really good on him 
And then you kind of go into just the general tanky ones. Like you take iron skin for, you know, health. You take uh, uh, demolish to take down a turret. But you could also go with font of life or whatever. But, you know, second wind is really good on Shin as well. And then I picked uh, as like the recommended for that is to go in the like inspiration tree and go futures market and like either hex flash or um i can't remember what the other the one boots the people want to like cosmic insight or something right oh, okay. and that's kind of a standard shin deal and i'll tell you this futures market really underratedly good for any champion oh, that's I lane i love it right now yeah it's oh really good goodness. if you have a lane bully champion because you can get all that extra money early right mm -hmm. and they can early back and then come back strong yeah come back way stronger than you should be but like i've been playing it with uh like weird i know but shin with uh sorcery and then I've been going Ultimate Hat and Transcendence. Hmm. Okay. And sure. so that, like, one, Ultimate Hat is good because your cooldown is forever fucking long on your ult. And then Transcendence <laughs> is good because your cooldowns, you, you don't really max out cooldown unless you start buying, like, tank items that actually have a ton of cooldown. And most of those are tied to mana. And Shin mm -hmm. doesn't want mana. But even if you go over the limit, then you can get some AD. Gotcha. So, um, I mean, yeah. I, thought, I thought that one was pretty good. But, you know, all in all, like, every one of my support items, there's... I tried Klepto Lux support. I'm not really <laughs> into Klepto yeah. that much. Like, I, I just... I'm not sold. I don't really think it's that good. You know, I know that may be a controversial thing to say, but I, you know, I don't really think it's all that good. But most of my main support pages are Comet, and the ones that aren't Comet are Airy, and the ones that aren't Airy are Electrocute, and all of those pretty much know who they are. Mm -hmm. You know yeah, what I mean? Favorite, Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. My my favorite mix-up for support is, and I don't know if this is off-meta or non-meta because it. It was popular from, I think, the, uh, oh, what's the Korean? Kespa Cup in Korea. Basically, like, people were taking Malzahar support again with a, uh, wow, I just totally forgot. Spellbook? The spellbook, unsealed spellbook. And that's the one where you can switch out uh, your summoner spells, except no one switches out their summoner spells. What they do is they take advantage of the reduced cooldown on your summoner spells. So yeah. with all the cooldown reduction that you can get and with lucidity boots, you can have a flash that's like three and a half minutes or something like that. So when Malzahar, all I did was flash every three and a half minutes to catch out someone with his ult and then the rest of the team followed up. So I love taking that on any like flash engaged champion, like an Annie would be really, really awesome to do that on too. So that's something that I like in the support role or any, I guess you could do that with anyone that's an engaging unless they really need something in the laning phase. like. Grass with the dying or something. I, like I will say biscuit delivery and support is pretty oh, underrated. That's great too. It, yeah. It's really particularly good if you have a mana chugger, like a brand, mm -hmm. or Lux, because you spam a lot of spells with Lux to poke, right? Zoe. Uh, I don't know about <laughs> Zoe because I've never played. Like, don't really play Zoe. So, I but know. I mean, I'm if if she's a spell spammer, then sure, yeah, that would totally work. Cool. Because I All mean, right, the big problem is you just run out of juice after a while. Yeah, the yeah. Biscuit not only permanently increases your mana pool, but it also gives you like fifteen percent when you need it. So that's nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Last question from Agile Otter: Who are the best streamers to watch to learn AD carry positioning? One that I really like that's really underrated. Uh, his name is Prismal. He was in the. Uh, Lola scouting grounds that they did, which is where they bring on some challenger players who are not a part of the pro scene to the uh, Lola play. Lola scouting grounds? We did. A, we did. Or er, sorry, Lola, <laughs> the LOL League of Legends esports spot scouting grounds. Oh, and, I uh, Lola scouting grounds. Yeah. 
I just assumed it was something Sam set up and didn't talk to me about. Probably yeah. Like <laughs> you know? Anyway, anyway, like? Prismal, look him up. He talks through. He hasn't been uploading as recently. He streams pretty re uh, regularly, but his YouTube channel as well. He has some game commentaries, and he's really good about talking about every decision he makes and why he does it. And he's just a really good source of information if you're looking to get better at ADC. He's a very smart player. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. you know, you can go with the whole, like, watch any pro or watch anybody at high elo. Um, literally, anybody who takes the time to explain their reasoning is a good choice. Yeah. And so I would say focus on people that have a small enough i'll tell you this like painless death is a perfect example you could also watch a support player but then focus on his adc right um, <laughs> and you know interesting. like that's interesting thought but you know the thing that whenever i watch painless death stream that attracted me to his particular stream was that he would take the time to explain what the hell he was doing to like a small dedicated group of fans. Uh, he's grown a bit since then, but it still like feels the same, right? Because mm -hmm. he'd take the time to explain what the hell is going on or what he was thinking or why he did what he did. And that's what made it informative. Like they don't have to have the word educational in their stream to be informative. Right. <laughs> yeah. They're like, Geronimo used to be really informative and really educational and now not so much. And he was an yeah. ADC streamer that advertised as being an ADC Academy. And it used to really be that because he used to spend all of his time saying, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm doing that. But that's kind of fallen off as I think his enjoyment with the game has kind of waned a bit in recent years. Yeah, the other thing I would say to do, something that actually play a lot better without actually ADC much, was uh, after you watch someone like Prismal or someone who will explain exactly what they're doing, and you start to get an understanding of why players do things, go and watch someone like Gosu. If you watch a Gosu video with nothing in mind, it's really flashy, like all he does is show like real highlights and you think, oh wow, look at that, look at this, and you can get nothing out of it. But if you really watch his positioning sometimes when you're watching a Gosu video, like he plays Vayne a lot of the time. Vayne gets super punished for her positioning. So he is very good about going into a fight and then suddenly pulling out and you're like, wait, why like as an instinct, it would always be like, oh, why doesn't he keep fighting? Like, he's got the advantage. But he pulls out for a second and then re-engages. Like, that's... I think Gosu is one of the best players I watch that's really good about that, of, like, engaging and then pulling off and re-engaging. And I recently watched one of his videos. It was, like, one of his, uh, like, came out a couple days ago where he, like, went into a barren pit to kill someone. And then he had to, like, flash over the wall towards the enemy but him put him in a position where the enemy couldn't get hit to him, even though he was away from his team. And it was just like, mm -hmm. wow, that was such good a good idea. Like his positioning was so good, and I never would have thought about that. Right. I mean, but, sometimes you just gotta like flash out, you know. Sometimes you gotta pull out so that you can re-engage later. Um, you know, you don't want to blow your load wait, all in one sitting there. early on in the team fight. You gotta pace yourself. <laughs> It'll All right, you uh, and your partner. <laughs> support. Thank you so much, Agile Otter, for all the questions. Um, and thanks everyone else that written, wrote in. And uh, uh, hopefully that was really helpful. So just to close out this episode, I haven't been doing this in a while, but I just wanted to do a Patreon because we have a ton of patrons that have helped us out a lot for December. I'm just going to read them off really quickly. Yeah, we got Alex Fisher. Sometimes you got to spice it up with uh, lubes or jellies. You know, maybe God. go ribbed. Your timing is so good, another. Blake. Your comedic timing is amazing. <laughs> it always seems to catch me off guard. That's what I was going for. <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> so we got Alex Fisher, Wappy Floppy, AK3331, Inquisitor Kane, Radog, Fear My Bush, Black, Black uh, Android 96, Ask Clay Scriff, Ted K, RM Azriel, Blake Mushin, Jakey Boo, Recon, Recon, Reconner, Reconner, uh, something like that. 
Flood Knight, 55. Could it be and a Breckener? I mean, there's there's letters missing. That's why it kind of... I mean, I don't Dr. see... Dr. Ham, list. Mr. Steel Your Core, Ice Cream Dreams, Dancing Willow, Not the Bees, Ice Swords, Blackbeard, Bandit, UHL, Hazard, Ruku Egg, Grubby Conductor, Come Back Kid, Nobody, Gunday Monday, Emil Richter, and Dragon the Great. Thank you so much for your guys' help. Um, we raised, I think, 136 dollars this past month of that again helps with the hosting costs getting us those mics and everything like that we have a goal to hit 200 we hit it at one point and now we're back below but that's perfectly fine um so if we hit 200 we're, we're really trying to push our youtube content and like make more like helpful videos and start doing 60 second tips again and stuff like this all it's it takes a lot of time to edit like the last lola plays thing that i edited which you guys should check it out because I'm really, really proud of it. It took me like literally eight to nine hours in one sitting or something like that. So that was just ridiculous. All right, um, two things real quick. Did I make this time? Did I make it this time? I yes, submitted like a I, million I, plays. Okay, this, this is the thing. This is the funny part. Because yeah, Blaster Boy usually does it. You didn't have a play for December. So I had to go into November to find you a play. Thank you. I, <laughs> I, I added so that. many. I had two I, plays that didn't get in uh, Deeply yeah, I was, saddened. I, I was gonna put yours in, but I forgot. Okay, so I picked a song, a random song, and then when I was like two minutes long, I was like, oh crap. I picked like the shortest song possible. <laughs> so yours was like the last one cut. I'm sorry. And it was because we had not because it wasn't a good play, but because we had a lot a lot of new names I've never seen submit in low plays, so we had to put those in. I just want you to know that I've never been in all right, so I don't I, believe that. That's bullshit. <laughs> no, Question no. number two. Uh, it's true. It's not bullshit. Nah, that seems like Maybe bullshit. you need to be better. I'm calling bullshit on that. But anyway, question number two is, uh, hey, we're going to talk about how many people we got yesterday in community games. That was Holy moly. Awesome. Yeah. So that was interesting. Uh, we had like – so what happens is like, go. <laughs> yeah, so what happens is that – eight o'clock comes around and sometimes i'm in discord waiting sometimes i'm not lately i've been like you know trying to maximize my time and i've been doing stuff and i jump in and i'm like oh we have like eight people already in there wow we're probably gonna have a little too many people for community games again this is gonna be kind of weird and i don't know what to do about it and i'm like none of the hosts are on yet but they all got in like pretty much on time and suddenly like 803 came around and we had like 17 people i was like what the hell and luckily, like, I think Alberto was like, hey, can I shoutcast? I'm like, yes, yes, you can. <laughs> and then, like, Jaycast was like, I want to shoutcast. So we split up in, like, twos, and we had two streams going. And I actually probably needed to make another Lola Twitch account so we could link the VODs to go straight onto YouTube to make it just easy. Um, I don't – yeah, I got to figure that out. But, yeah, we actually had two, sh two games going on at once, and it was really, really cool. I a lot of people had fun. We had a ton of new faces and names and voices in there. It was a good time. And, um, yeah, we got to start ramping up and vamping up, like, people. I think um, Gundy Money is going to join us next week to help Shoutcast and stuff like that. That's so we're, if you, He's actually yeah. good at it. Yeah, so the, the, rough plan <laughs> is, <laughs> the rough plan is to actually, like, have a host doing color shoutcasting, which is, like, kind of talking about the analytics and, like, just talking back and forth. Then there's a play-by-play -play shoutcaster, which is the thing that everyone sucks at because it's hard to do when they're actually talking about what's going on on the screen. So we're hoping to find people to play-by-play -play cast so the host can color cast and still like be like, hey, we're here. And Sam, I guess you kind I, of like us. I don't us. know about you, man, but I would really prefer it if the host would color blind cast. It's 2018. <laughs> Get with just, the times, Sam. Get with the times, dude. Uh, um, it should just we'll have, here on the Lola podcast. We'll have one stream for color casting, and we'll have another stream for colorblind <laughs> casting, <laughs> just to make sure that everyone. We'll have separate is. water fountains for each team after. The <laughs> whoa, is over. Whoa, whoa. That's the reference you were making. <laughs> That's not the yeah, reference. Blake, <laughs> way too far. I don't know what that <laughs> came out of nowhere. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So if you guys are interested in helping us cast or help even organizing, like. I know, shout out to Sothazil, because he was actually making lobbies. That just like took a huge weight off of our shoulders to like just coordinate things because you know there's a spectator delay, so we get out of games three minutes later and we're still talking about the game. So getting everyone like up and running into games was really, really helpful. If you guys want to help with the community games, that would be super appreciated. And um, 
yeah, thank you so much for showing up because that is literally the biggest we've ever had community games, and it was it was a blast. It was really scary and really exciting. <laughs> it was a good time. Yeah, Kinda and like if you guys, prom. <laughs> if you guys help out more, then maybe you can actually uh, let take over the shoutcasting while some of us play. So then uh, you can try to beat us because I yeah, know we... uh, <laughs> I know yeah, I haven't hoping... played for a couple weeks. In the yeah, community. I finally got a game in. I like I was like, I'm gonna play. Can you shoutcast? And he's like. I oh <laughs> yeah i meant to say this if uh you know everybody's uploading their videos to the youtube or whatever uh if you were on the second game that i shout casted it's uh -oh. on my twitch channel i have not like they're all on them. youtube right now even the one i did i stayed up until two in the morning two night two nights ago putting them up how did you do my channel and upload it did you just, just went on the whole thing uh twitch leecher which twitch alec told me about Ooh, neat. So, yeah. yeah. So I took all care right. of it. They're Never all, mind in, then. They're all in a nice playlist. There's stream A and stream B. And we'll figure out actually a stream A and stream B to make it a little easier for you guys to watch. Because, yeah, it, it just we didn't realize we had this issue. And it's a good problem. So we're trying to acclimate to it. And hopefully we have three streams next week. And we're just like, <laughs> I don't know what to do. And you can see me completely like, flustered and like freaking out for 30 minutes before our community game starts so um that was fun and yeah if we get enough people it'd be great because we want the host to also rotate so you guys can play with us and we can play with you guys and you know blake can yell at you for being a bad day to carry and you know <laughs> enjoy the joy i mean of having i don't blake get upset with you having done that but i'm not gonna <laughs> say i didn't <laughs> <laughs> i'm only kidding kind of kind of um, <laughs> so yeah but i kind of want to yeah Community games were awesome. Again, with the Patreon, we're trying to hit 200 so we can start like pushing out more content. Like Worm and I have been talking about lame, uh, doing a wave management like kind of series and taking like plays.tv highlights of laning so we can like talk about it and give suggestions to help you out. So it all costs a lot of time and yeah, editing power. I've been writing backstories for uh, yeah. Manny's lore. <laughs> for Manny's lore. Like, oh my gosh, like, a community game. Someone's like, I'm here for the trash flute. I'm here like, oh, for the trash flute solo. <laughs> yeah, Manny didn't even show up. Manny didn't show so, up. That's yeah. way to let the people down, Manny. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so bad for him. All right. So, anyways, besides that, big announcement. Besides community games, um, we are going to do a listener call-in show. Like we talked about in a previous episode, getting feedback from you guys. So, we have a sign-up form. The link is in the episode description. Click on that. It basically is like put your Discord and your email address and if you know what you want to talk about. Then we'll fill up the... Uh, I think we're doing it at the end of this month. So it's the last Thursday of this month, which is the 25th. So that's in two weeks. So hopefully you can join us in Discord. We can do that, see how it goes, and it'll be a good time. Yeah. It's always better with more people. All right. So yeah. I just realized I'm a terrible parent because it's like 10, 15, and I've just let my kid watch YouTube videos for like <laughs> two and a half hours past this <laughs> time. Yeah, this episode went surprisingly long suddenly. I am so yeah, sorry. Yeah, I thought I was going to give him like a treat and be like, yeah, you're going to bed at like 9, 15 tonight. Not like, <laughs> it's 10, 10. 16. But that's what <laughs> happens when you false start three or four times on a podcast. <laughs> if, if we make it to $250 a month, we will buy... Uh, uh, like a babysitter bed upstairs <laughs> we'll have a babysitter for the night hmm. there you go underpaid babysitter hammock to throw him in in the back here <laughs> actually i would like that if we could buy a lola hammock i would be totally down for your son right sure <laughs> <laughs> all for the kids but he's really big so we're gonna need to buy like an adult size one <laughs> He's, like, he's just, you get him a kid's one, he's going to grow right out of that. Yeah, yeah. It's all about mm -hmm. thinking about the future. Yeah. All right. So uh, that is it for this episode of the Lola Podcast. We will see you guys. Oh, wait, actually, we'll see you guys next week with a guest. A very exciting guest. I don't know if Worm knows about this. Blake knows about it. Are you, but are Scar, you just going to leave it mystery guest? Or are you gonna no, say no, no. Something? Scar has already uh, confirmed that he will be available next Thursday to do a podcast with us awesome. so that should be interesting if you guys that. don't know who he is i'm sorry you lived under a rock 
He used to write patch notes. He was the voice of Riot's podcast. He's no longer with Riot. He's doing his own stuff. He's a variety streamer and doing a ton of other stuff. Also League of Legends. Really funny guy. Really smart guy. Uh, I don't know what we're going to talk about. But we'll talk League and just kind of what he does. So stay tuned for that one. All right. So that is it for this episode of the Little Podcast. We will see you guys next week. All right. Good night, everybody.